Well, hello again. This is going to be chapter five. Um, we're in the final chapter before our first test. Uh, so I hope you guys are keeping up with the homework on masteringbiology.com. Uh, I did, I noticed that you had to purchase labs and I talked to uh, the representative and you can purchase all the labs uh, at once or you can purchase them individually. That is completely up to you on how you want to do that. Uh, there are four labs, so uh, that lets you know I skipped some of the labs because they they weren't really over things that we're going to cover uh, in this class. Um, so last time we talked about the cell, and this time we're going to talk about kind of how the cell works. So for one of the quick writes, and this is what you're going to do, I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to write down, jot down some ideas, upload that into the discussion forum on Blackboard, and after you, you upload that, you can look at others and look at others' ideas and read back and forth and help formulate your thoughts. Then once your thoughts are formulated, you can submit those to the journal on Blackboard. So I hope that's clear. A lot of people have emailed me about that, and I'm, uh, I'll see if I, uh, I'll do some sort of recording or something to show what exactly it is uh, I'm looking for uh, to, to help you guys out. So the, the, uh, one of the quick writes for this chapter is at the very, very f first part. And the question is, what does it mean when someone says you are what you eat? What does it mean when someone says you are what you eat? Think about that for a second. Uh, and that's going to be uh, one of the quick writes for this chapter. So one of the really neat things in nature that you will see is bioluminescence. And uh, what those organisms do is inside their cells, they use energy to uh, con and convert it into a reaction to produce light. We, we see chemical reactions that produce light you know, with glow sticks and, and things like that. Um, and 90% of the deep sea marine life produces some sort of bioluminescence because there's very, very little light down there, if at all. Uh, and so they kind of produce their own, and animals down there are generally very attracted to some sort of, of light. So the big ideas here that we're going to be talking about, membrane structure and function. We're going to talk about that fluid mosaic, and the, those proteins, and different kinds of proteins. Um, we're going to talk about energy in the cell, and then we're going to talk about en enzyme function. Okay, so here's a picture of bioluminescence. Um, it looks like a, a deep sea squid. Uh, and so those creatures are really neat to see. Um, so many of the cell's reactions for this bioluminescence, they take place in the organelles. And it's the enzymes embedded in the membranes, these organelles, that help produce this. So let's get talking a little bit about those membranes uh, so you can understand that a little better. So this is what, what it means by a fluid mosaic. Uh, they're composed of that bilayer of phospholipids. And then there's proteins inside that structure. Uh, and that structure, that, that, that bilayer, is constantly moving. And there's different things in there. And so it's, that's what they mean by a fluid mosaic. And that's important to remember, because if it wasn't, uh, we wouldn't be, things wouldn't come in and out, and we wouldn't be able to, our cells would not be able to breathe. So here's a picture, and this is in your book, and this is kind of a, an overall view of what's going on inside the cell. And so you can see the phospholipid bilayer right here, and then you can see right here there's cell-cell communication going on, right? Different types of proteins, cell-cell recognition, and then you have some active transport, some passive transport, some facilitated transport going on. You have uh, different things moving um, against our concentration gradient, um, signaling molecules, all sorts of different things uh, going on in here on the cell to help keep it uh, active, to help keep it functional. Uh, and, and we'll talk. We'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. We're going to go through uh, each one of those 
um, as we talk about this. So some of these proteins uh, are there just to help keep the shape, right? So to keep it uh, in, in somewhat of, of uh, a, a spherical shape. Um, it's obviously not going to be a perfect sphere all the time, and sometimes they get squished like your skin cells and different things like that, but it helps keep the shapes. Uh, some proteins are, are receptors, so they help uh, receive messages uh, from other cells. Some function as enzymes, help catalyze or, uh, reactions. Um, the glycoproteins are involved in cell-cell recognition. This is important so a heart cell doesn't think it's a skin cell and, and that sort of thing. Or if there's another cell um, in your bloodstream, a foreign cell, then uh, your other cells will recognize it as foreign. Your white blood cells will recognize it and this helps your immunity. Um, and then uh, the membranes are selectively permeable. And what that means is it can select things that will come in and out of the cell. And that's important because you don't want just anything to come into your house. Uh, you want to be uh, selective as to who comes into your house and, and think of your cells kind of like that. So the phospholipids uh, on, on the cell are key to... Uh, uh, those phospholipids are, are, are key to how the cell functions. And the real interesting thing about these phospholipids is that they can form spontaneously in water. So there, it's, and, and what, your book, what your book means by spontaneously is it doesn't uh, just happen. There's physics and chemistry behind it. But we're not going to get into that physics and chemistry in this class, uh, and I'm not going to expect you to know it. But, so you, uh, you can think of it as spontaneous. But these membranes are going to form. Uh, there's chemical reactions and, and physics that kind of push, pull, and causes these membranes to form. Uh, so you, we can get protocells with membranes around it. We can get uh, membranes forming around different proteins. Uh, we can get membranes forming around nucleotides. Uh, and so this, uh, it, it's very interesting to see this in the evolution of the cell. And here's your picture of membranes uh, spontaneously forming. Uh, in water, and in this case it's just engulfing water, but it had that engulfed protein, that protein could start to do work inside the cell with the other ingredients in the cell. So once again we have the uh, hydrophilic part of the cell and the hydrophobic part of the cell, and you should know those, those differences by now. So I'm going to take a quick step out and I'm going to ask you guys question that I want you to, to think about. And so I'm going to draw a beaker here. And we're going to put a semi-permeable membrane in the middle of this beaker. Semi-permeable. This membrane is going to be permeable to water, but not permeable to salt. Okay. So here's water. And each side of that beaker and then we're going to put salt in here. And I'm just going to represent salt with X's. Okay? And we're going to put a whole bunch of salt on one side. My pen's getting crazy. And a little bit of salt on the other side. I want you to look at this. Remember, the membrane is permeable to water, but not salt. And if we set this beaker on a table, which direction would the water flow? Would water be higher on the left side? Would water be higher on the right side? Or would water stay the same? So would water be higher on the left side, the right side? Or would water stay the same? I want you to think about that for a second. Um, and uh, this will be part of the, um, the discussion. Uh, I want you to discuss and upload online what your thoughts were before and after we, we go through this. Okay? So go ahead and take a moment to, to jot that down.
Okay, the answer is the water will increase on the left side. Water will move from right to left, and so the water level will rise on the left side. And this seems counterintuitive to a lot of people, but we're going to discuss why, why that is. Okay, so diffusion, the tendency of particles to spread out evenly in an available space. Okay, so particles, they all kind of want their own space, uh, and this will just kind of generally happen, um, and it doesn't take any energy for this to happen. Particles will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, okay? So when you're thinking about the previous slide, you would think that there's, since there's a higher concentration of salt on the left, that it would move to the right. And had that membrane been permeable to salt, that's what would have happened. This means that the particles diffuse down their concentration gradient, okay? And then once it reaches equilibrium, it, it stops. So diffusion across that membrane that doesn't take energy is called passive transport. So there's no energy involved. It's just going to happen because of something called Brownian movement, and that's, you're not going to be responsible for knowing that. Just understand that uh, passive transport does not require energy. Um, but when there is a concentration gradient, that represents potential energy. And if you get into neurology, um, you'll see how important that is. This is an animation. If you download the slides uh, from the website, you can see these animations. Um, and they'll talk a little bit about it, and that'll help, hopefully help uh, make you under, help you understand this concept. So if we have a whole bunch of solutes on the left, and there's pores, they're going to move to the right. And they're going to keep moving until they reach equilibrium. And then some will cross left and right, and there'll be a continual crossing. But essentially, it will be at equilibrium. And this happens if you have green dye, red dye. Uh, the green will move across to the right, and red will move across to the left until they're equal on both sides. And so there's a net diffusion across that membrane. Um, water, it's very important that water crosses uh, across a membrane. We need water for uh, our, the reactions that occur in our body. So pay attention to this definition of osmosis. The diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane is called osmosis. So it's not just diffusion. So osmosis is part of diffusion, but osmosis specifically deals with water across the selectively permeable membrane. And so here's some more animations that you can download and look at. So if you have a membrane and it's permeable to water but not the solute, go back to what we talked about just a few moments ago. Water will cross, cross the membrane and moving down its own concentration gradient. It will try to make both sides of those beaker uh, equal, and equal parts water, equal parts solutes. It will try to make both parts reach equilibrium, and that's what causes the water to rise on the left-hand side. So here's a graphic showing um, specifically that. So if you look here to the left, you see a few solutes. If you look here to the right, there's a whole bunch of solutes. Then you have your permeable membrane right here. And then what will happen is the water level will rise over here as it tries to reach equilibrium. And once again, I understand that's counterintuitive. So it's important to understand that concept. That is osmosis. Okay. Tonicity uh, is the ability for a cell to gain or lose water. Okay, we're going to talk about tonicity in different types. Um, and it depends on the concentration inside and outside of the cell. So iso, iso means same. So isotonic means the concentration of solutes inside the cell and outside are the same. Hypo uh, means that there's less on one side or the other. Um, and then hyper is when there's a whole bunch. So think of hypo as lacking, hyper as having a whole bunch. Uh, so hypertonic solution, the concentration is higher outside the cell. 
uh, and water molecules will move out of the cell and the cell will shrink because it's trying to reach equilibrium. A hypotonic, uh, the concentration is, is lower outside the cell and water will move into the cell. Okay, and here's, um, and what we do for an animal cell to survive, they have to do what's called osmoregulation, regulating the osmotic pressure, regulating that's those solutes in there uh, to make sure that um, they're not getting too much water or too little water. That's osmoregulation. So the cell walls and plant cells and prokaryotes and fungi, uh, the water balance issues, they're a little different because uh, the cell walls are, are a little bit different. Um, so the cell wall itself is, that cellulose is a strong uh, fiber structure. And we looked at cellulose in, in the last lecture. So that can prevent the cell from taking in too much water and bursting. Um, but in hypertonic en environments, plant and animal cells will both shrivel. And so here's your comparison. On the top are animal cells, on the bottom are plant cells. So in a hypotonic solution, when the cell is hypotonic, uh, then it's going to take in water and the cell will actually burst. In the isotonic solution, it's just fine. In the hypertonic solution, it's going to shrivel up because water is leaving the cell. In the plant cells, remember they, they look kind of brick-like, uh, so you get a, what's called a turgid cell when it has uh, water and this helps a plant uh, stay up. If you watch a, put a plant in your garden and you're watching it grow and it starts to get weepy and then you give it some water and an hour later it's nice and, and stiff and not weepy anymore. Right? It, it has become turgid. Uh, then flaccid is when it's in isotonic and then in hypertonic it's shriveled. So Hydrophobic substances go across the membrane. Remember that membrane with the hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails? Because once it gets inside the membrane, it, it, those are hydrophobic tails. And so it can move uh, easily across the membrane. But polar and charged uh, substances don't move easily across the membrane. So they need help. And this is called facilitated diffusion. So when uh, the diffusion is facilitated because of polar charged substances, it's facilitated diffusion. Um, and some proteins are specifically designed to help uh, help these uh, molecules that are charged or polar uh, move through that protein. And that's, that's their whole job is to facilitate uh, that fusion. Other proteins will bind to different molecules and then change shape and release those molecules on the other side. And we'll see pictures of this here, here in a minute. Um, in, in both of those situations where um, they make a tunnel or they bind and release, uh, the protein is specific for the substrate. Um, and so that can be sugar, amino acids, ions, and, and water. Um, and water is polar. And so we talked about polar substances having problems moving across the membrane. So there's specific protein channels called aquaporins that allow water in and out uh, very quickly. So aquaporins are essential to life. So here's your picture of a transport protein and the solute molecule. This uh, is, could be facilitated. This is simply diffusion. It doesn't take energy, any energy to do this. Uh, active transport, however, has, requires energy to actively move. But what you can do with active transport is you can move solutes against their concentration gradient. So while normally it's always fighting to reach equilibrium, you can actually move uh, more of one type of solute into the cell than, uh, than normally would be there. And so the cell can use that to create um, potential energy and, and other things for the cell to do. Uh, that it needs to do to survive. And so here's an animation. Uh, once again, you can download it. But it'll show uh, this protein here in the middle. These sodium ions will fit right here in each one of these. And then ATP will come up and drop a phosphorus off and bind to the bottom, which will make the protein change shape and release those 
into whoop, uh, outside of the cell. Um, and then at that point, the potassium ions can come in and uh, then the cell will revert back to its original shape and release those potassium ions inside the cell. And so it can move against the concentration gradient. And that's very important. So on the far left is a transport protein. And this, this is just a little clearer picture of what I was showing you. Uh, the solute moves in. It binds to the protein. ATP comes by, changes the shape of the protein. It releases the, pro the solutes outside the cell and back and forth. So that's how work gets done at the cell. Um, there's two mechanisms to get large molecules, because we just looked at small molecules. Um, the large molecules use exocytosis. Uh, that gets rid of things. And endocytosis, that brings things in. Uh, but in both cases, uh, the material uh, is packaged within a vesicle. And so there are three kinds of endocytosis. Remember, endo, bringing things in. So you've got uh, phagocytosis, which engulfs uh, um, those large uh, molecules, sometimes called cell eating. Uh, pinocytosis uh, is the same thing, but it's more like cell drinking. Pinocytosis will bring in uh, things like sugars, but it's more like cell drinking. And then receptor-mediated receptor endo cytosis. Um, and so there's a receptor-coated pit, and so you have special receptors. And when those receptors get hit, there's an invagination of the cell wall, and whatever's around gets brought into the cell. Um, and there's animations here you can download um, on Blackboard, and it'll go through each one of those. But here at the top is the cell eating. You can look at the large food or particle. Um, and so the cell will kind of reach out and grab it and bring it into the cell. There's a cell drinking in the, mi in the middle. You can see it's drinking that fluid, but also maybe a sugar or two. And at the bottom, the receptor mediated. You can see when those, those specific molecules hit those receptors, there's an invagination. And all of them create these vesicles for the cell to use. So uh, now we're going to talk about energy in the cell. Um, energy, obviously, is the most important uh, resource because without energy, um, we wouldn't be able to stay uh, the complex organisms we are. And we'll talk a bit about that when we get to the laws of thermodynamics. So um, cells are small units, and so you think of them like a factory. We talked about that factory and its housing and different things. Um, and so there's chemical reactions that you use for cell maintenance, making cell parts, and replication. And all of those require energy. So energy is the ability to do work. Uh, this book de defines it as the capacity to cause change or to perform work, essentially kind of the same thing. Um, there's two kinds of energy, kinetic, which is the energy of motion when you're moving, when uh, you're driving down the street. Uh, energies, uh, potential energies being turned into kinetic energy. And then there's potential energy, which is the energy availability um, as a result of where it is. So some, uh, a ball on, on, a big heavy ball on top of a roof, you could drop it. If it fell through a turbine, it would turn that turbine, and we could convert that to energy. And so you might think, well, that's a great way to produce energy, but you have to realize you have to get the ball back up on top of the roof to do it again. And the, what's lost when that turbine turns or, or when that ball is dropped, there, there's energy lost in the form of heat. And that heat is energy we cannot get back. So here's a picture of that. So uh, gasoline and oxygen um, are the potential energy. When it gets burned, it turns into kinetic energy. And the heat coming from your engine, the tires on the road, different things like that, that is energy that is lost that cannot be gotten back. And then you have your waste products. Uh, in cellular respiration, it's very similar. So you have sugar, oxygen, it goes into the cell, creates ATP, but heat is lost and you can't get that back. But that's why you warm up when you eat. Um, that's why they say if you're getting hypothermia to eat because your cells will start doing more work and that heat energy 
will move through your body. So we talked about temperature and heat. Um, in this, the heat or thermal energy, it's the type of kinetic energy. And that's just associated with the, the random movement of particles or think of that ball dropping off and hitting that turbine, the friction there, um, the heat that it's caused or, um, or uh, you know, the heat that comes off your car engine. So light is also a type of kinetic energy, those photons, and that's why plants can use it to create sugars. So chemical energy is the potential energy um, in, a, in any sort of chemical reaction. Um, and that's what we use. We call it metabolism. So uh, this is another animation that explains potential and kinetic energy. Um, you use muscle energy in your muscles to pull, pull the bow, which creates potential energy for the arrow. When you release the arrow, it flies through. When it hits the target, it releases heat, and that energy is lost. So thermodynamics, thermo, heat, dynamics, kind of movement. Right? It's this, uh, the study of energy transformations. How does energy flow through a system? Right? Um, and they use the word system for the matter. Right? We talked about matter. It's composed of atoms, uh, has weight, takes up space. Um, for the matter under the study and the surroundings for uh, the rest of the universe. So that's kind of how they're defining it. So the two laws of thermodynamics, and this is very, very important. Um, the first law says that energy in the universe is constant, okay? Energy cannot be uh, created or destroyed, but energy will flow through a system. The second law says energy conversions increase the disorder, and entropy is a measure of that disorder. So some people say you can't have a complex organism um, because it can't be explained because of the law of entropy. Uh, people say that all the time. That is an incorrect interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics because they're in a closed system, they are perfectly correct. But our bodies, um, organisms, are not closed systems. They are open systems, which means we eat and we, we take in energy. And as we take in energy, that uh, allows for that complexity to go. So as energy is flowing through a system, each organism pulling in some of that energy allows the complexity to occur. If we stopped eating and breathing, we would become closed systems and follow exactly the second law of thermodynamics and just degrade into entropy. But we're not. We're open systems. Organisms are open systems. They're taking things in. They're pushing things out. Uh, so there's movement in that system allowing for complexity to occur. So we use oxygen in our reactions to release uh, energy. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, oxygen is very corrosive, but that's what we've evolved to use. And so um, it, it seems to work. It may not work very well, but it works. So in cellular respiration, that chemical energy is stored and then converted into a form called ATP that we can use. So chemical reactions are either extragonic, they release energy, or endergonic, they, they input, they bring in energy, okay? An extragonic reaction, so that's when energy is moving out. Um, so in, when we're looking at molecules and the bonds, when those bonds are broken and energy is released, it's going out. Burning wood, the cellulose, uh, the sugar that is cellulose in the wood, it releases energy. Um, in, in the form of heat and light. Uh, so cellular respiration involves many steps, releases energy slowly, and this is very, very important, that it releases energy slowly, um, because if we got all the energy from glucose all at once, we would spontaneously burst into flames. So it's good that it releases energy slowly. Um, and then we use some of that released energy to produce ATP. Okay, so here is uh, your graphic. Um, you have potential energy of the molecules uh, rising on the left-hand side, and you can see the energy and products and the amount of energy released from the reactants. So you have your reactants, you have your products, 
and we went over those chemical equations, so this should make a little more sense to you, and that releases energy, and the amount of energy released is the difference in the potential energy of the molecules. So if we have this potential energy right here, and we end up with this potential energy right here, the difference it's showing right, right here, the difference between these, those lines is the amount of energy that was released during that reaction. So in inorganic reactions, it takes in energy, um, and it can create products that are rich in potential energy. So you can think of endogonic reactions as the guy climbing up the ladder to uh, a diving board. And so at the top of the diving board, he has lots of potential energy. He jumps off. That potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. And when he hits the water, um, he's lost all of his potential energy until he builds that back up and walks back up that, uh, that ladder. So think of that as the inorganic reaction, building up, um, climbing up that ladder. Um, so the inorganic reactions, they begin with the reactant molecules that contain relatively little potential energy, but end up with products that contain more chemical energy. So it's the collection. And here is the, uh, the graphic. Um, and again, you can see the reactants. It puts energy in, and it creates products that now have a lot more potential energy. So it's the reverse with the exergonic. Photosynthesis is an endergonic reaction. So carbon dioxide has very little energy in water, has very little energy in it. But when you take that with sunlight, you uh, create glucose or cellulose, um, and that has a lot of energy in that molecule. So we, every day, every cell, we're always going over these reactions. We're always um, storing energy. We're always releasing energy. Um, and so when all those chemical reactions at your body at any given time is called metabolism. So metabolic pathway is a series of chemical reactions that are either going to build uh, anabolic, remember we talked about steroids, anabolic, build complex molecules, or breaks down, so catabolic. Anabolic build up, catabolic breakdown, and those are metabolic pathways. So energy coupling uses released energy from exergonic reactions, and this is uh, what happens in, in the mitochondria. Uh, so it takes that. Um, and they use, the body in the mitochondria usually stores that in the form of ATP molecules, in which we talked about ATP, but here it is again, the adenosine triphosphate. Um, and that is, is, is what we use for essentially everything uh, that occurs in our body. All that work from proteins and replication and cell maintenance, that's all driven by, by ATP. So ATP has that nitrogenous base, uh, and then the five carbon sugar ribose, and then three phosphate groups. And there's potential energy in those three phosphate groups. So hydrolysis, remember, um, dehydration synthesis uh, and hydration, hydrolysis of ATP releases energy by transferring the third phosphate. So if you think of ATP like this, okay? There's the nucleic, here's the sugar, and then and there should be a graphic in, in here doing the same thing. And here are your phosphates. Okay. So through hydrolysis, this is broken right here. So then it becomes Then it becomes diphosphate. So we'll change that to a D. My pen's getting crazy. And that probably made it very difficult to see. But there's a graphic here, and that will help. So um, and cellular work depends on, on that. So uh, here you go. You got the adenosine triphosphate. So there's the adenine, there's the ribose sugar, and there's your three phosphates. And then the hydrolysis pops off this third phosphate, and boom. Uh, there's energy, and it becomes adenosine diphosphate.
phosphate. Um, and then we talked about the three main types of cellular work, chemical, mechanical, transport, and ATP works for all of those. And, oh, my pin just died. Well, please be patient while I work out our technology. There we go. So there's chemical work, there's mechanical work, and there's transport work. Um, so proteins, motor proteins, those are your muscles, right? Um, how every time you move your arm, twitch your eye, whatever, okay? Chemical works, products, reactants, uh, either building up or breaking down. Um, transport work uh, is uh, moving the solutes from one side to the other, and we discussed those earlier. And so ATP is renewable. You can create um, ATP. Uh, and in that ATP cycle, the energy released in an exergonic reaction, uh, so it's releasing energy. So when you're running a lot, you warm up. So think of it that way, such as the breakdown of glucose is used in an endergonic reaction to generate ATP. So there's a cycle. And here's the cycle. Energy from exergonic reaction, phosphorylation, ATP, hydrolysis, energy for endogonic reactions. And you have, then you, you have your ADP. So ATP is made, it's used, it's made, it's used over and over and over again. So now we're into enzymes. And these are uh, important because of this activation energy. Um, and then the, there's a lot of potential energy um, but it's not released spontaneously. And once again, we don't want all the energy in our body released spontaneously because we would just kind of burst into flames. And that is hardly ever good. Um, so it's good that it's there and it's not being released spontaneously. Um, the energy barrier has to be overcome. There's some, usually some sort of energy barrier to prevent uh, these reactions from spontaneously taking place place, and that's the activation energy, that energy barrier. Um, so, and this uh, talks about it moving uphill, and um, once, it, once you push, think of it as pushing a cart uphill, and once you get the cart to the top of the hill, it's a lot longer drop on the other side, um, and then you push it over, and that, as it's moving, that reaction is taking place. So one way you can do that, um, you, can sp you can speed up the reaction, you can add heat. Um, that heat will agitate the atoms, bonds break more easily. So you can release, uh, you can decrease energy activation by adding heat, but if you do that, it can kill a cell. Um, and so here's, here's your graphic. Um, I think of it like a, um, kind of like a ski slope, or, but there's not too much skiing around here in Texas. So um, on the left, you have the amount of energy needed, and then you have your reactant, and it needs to get over that activation barrier. It needs to kind of jump over that, and then you'll have products. And so the enzyme facilitates that jump. Think of the enzyme as uh, um, if you want, have to jump up to make a, a slam dunk basketball, and then the enzyme uh, is the uh, springboard or trampoline right in front of the basket to help you get up there so you don't have to do that whole, uh, you don't have to jump as hard. So try to think of, uh, think of it that way. So here's a bigger graphic showing you just what we, we talked about. And then the next one shows the enzyme, um, puts that springboard underneath you. And so here's uh, the important graph. And so you have reactants and products. And look at the difference between A and B. Um, and so A is obviously larger. Uh, enzymes can take A and turn it into B. Uh, it can lessen that energy of activation moving to the products. So they, they function as catalysts, and by they lower the energy of activation, and they increase the rate of the reaction. But here's the important part. It's not being consumed in the process. Um, 
and their enzymes are usually proteins, although some RNA molecules can function as enzyme. And I'm going to start moving a little faster. So here's an animation you can download if you download the slides. Um, an enzyme, depending on the shape, will determine what uh, reaction it helps. Um, and the specific reaction uh, that an enzyme acts on is called its substrate. And then on the enzyme, there's something called an active site, and that's where the substrate fits into. And so this is what makes enzymes specific. Um, and so there's a figure that's going to show that enzyme, and then you have your active site, and then you have the substrate that binds into that active site, and then you have the substrate that's converted into products. And my pen's dying again. Um, and then the products are released, and now we have something uh, that we can use. Um, and there's optimal con uh, conditions for enzymes. Uh, temperature uh, can affect motions. There are enzymes that work in high heat and low heat, um, but there's optimal temperatures, and our enzyme work best at uh, 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, there's also pH where it's optimal, um, the, and you can denature, of course, proteins. We talked about that with temperature and, and pH. Um, so non-protein helpers are called cofactors. They bind to the active sites, and they function as a catalyst. Um, some are inorganic, uh, zinc, copper, iron is why it's important to take vitamins. Um, uh, these enzymes require it. If a cofactor is organic, um, it's called a coenzyme. A chemical that interferes with an enzyme is called a competitive inhibitor. So it just simply blocks the substrate and then the, the enzyme can no longer function because uh, the substrate's blocked. And then there's non-competitive, and they block to somewhere other than the active site, but they change the shape of the enzyme. And so here you have uh, the normal binding, and then if you look at the non-competitive uh, inhibitor, it changes the shape, and it can no longer function, because when it comes to enzymes, it's all about the functions. Uh, well, the function depends on the shape. Um, so this, these enzyme inhibitors regulate uh, cell metabolism. Uh, in some reactions, the products um, act as inhibitors, and this is the feedback system, right? So we don't produce too much, and our body works on a lot of different feedback systems. And here's the basic idea. You have the starting molecule, there's reaction one with an enzyme, and then reaction two with an enzyme, and reaction three, and then you have a product. And product D then feeds back and doesn't allow the starting molecule or enzyme one to function anymore. And so we use drugs as enzyme inhib inhibitors. Um, ibuprofen, blood pressure, and antidepressants, all those are enzyme inhibitors. Um, and they've developed as poisons and pesticides for chemical warfare. Um, because if you inhibit certain enzymes, then your cells can't respirate at all. Uh, there's ibuprofen, I call this vitamin I, uh, because some people take it so much. Um, so that is the end of chapter five. We will have a test. I'll, I will open it up on Monday. And uh, then you guys uh, will start into module tool two. I'll open up that module. And that's a very short module. It's only two chapters. But we're going to talk about a photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And that's fairly complex. So I broke it down into just those two. Um, so you wouldn't be overwhelmed with the test. So. Um, study hard for the test. I'll have that test up very soon. Uh, and email me if you have.